Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. First Corinthians chapter 15. This is part two of chapter 15. And part two of the message is victory over death and hell. So last time we discussed the fact that in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And that is the foundation and the basis upon which we can then consider the next half of this chapter, which discusses the victory of God over death and hell. So uh, we'll explore that together, and um, and it will be good and edifying and encouraging if you open your heart and if you open your mind. If you don't, then uh, the things that will be shared will be um, difficult for you to fathom, <laughs> and um, it just will not be the blessing that it could be. I really believe that our religious tradition has robbed us of the glory and the majesty and the beauty of Christ and the the purpose of God for all people. I think um, religion has made us self-centered and egotistical, and so uh, so long as our salvation is assured, as long as we know that we are going to heaven, um, we don't so much think about the fate or the destiny or the outcome for other people. We might think about it occasionally. We might pray for the lost occasionally, very occasionally, and we might even share the gospel every so often, once in a great while. Uh, But I I suspect, and based on my experience uh, of having done this for many years, many decades, as a matter of fact, that most Christians are content to know that their sins are forgiven and they are going to heaven. Uh, Anyone who is concerned for the lost typically uh, will be categorized and labeled as someone who is an evangelist, and that's their special gift. But um, apart from that, most Christians are content to know that they are saved and and they may be concerned for their loved ones. But I, I want you to Think about the fact that God is concerned for every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of the earth, and Jesus died for all people. God desires that all would be saved and come to the full knowledge of of the truth, not just you and me, and not just our loved ones, but all people. And so this, this message is very important as we consider what God has actually accomplished in Christ which is far greater than just saving uh, saving a few. But it's, it's my belief, supported from many scriptures, that ultimately God intends to save all. So let's talk about how that might happen and, um, and make some observations, especially if we use uh, 1 Corinthians 15 as a basis upon which we can go. Now, we, we don't build any doctrine or teaching or message around one scripture or even one chapter. But when you take this into consideration with all the other things concerning God's purpose, God's character and nature, the mission and purpose of Jesus, uh, the, the evidence is overwhelming. And so the conflict comes not from what scripture says, but from our interpretation and from the religious tradition that we have accepted, uh, mostly without question, that whatever the church says, whatever the church teaches, and whatever religion has taught for the last 2,000 years, we just accept it as truth, and we never really dig any deeper than just the surface level of things. And so for that reason, some find it difficult when I speak along these lines or when I write along these lines And I could give them 50 scriptures, but they're going to find one or two and and dismiss the rest based on uh, those one or two verses that they find. Uh, Imagining that I have never read those verses myself, (laughs) right? (laughs) 
Well, it, see, it's not a question of what verses can we find to prove our position, because these scriptures are here, and you can take them, and you can use them to prove just about anything. Uh, some people use uh, that verse in Hebrews, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Well, some use that verse to prove that you're supposed to go to church three times a week or five times a week or at least once a week. So just because you can quote verses by itself does not prove anything because we can all use scripture verses to make whatever point that we make that that, that we want to make. Uh, so. In, in all cases, it's always a question of translation, interpretation, and application. Translation is what does it say? Interpretation is what does it mean? And application is how does it apply? Who does it apply to and how does it apply? And so in, in those three areas, uh, it's not sufficient just to say, well, this verse contradicts what you're saying. Um. Many of God's truths are wrapped up in spiritual paradoxes. And so the discrepancy, I believe, since I believe that Scripture can't be broken, I don't think that God contradicts himself, and I don't believe Scripture contradicts itself. So the contradiction or the apparent contradiction or the paradox, if you will, is not with what Scripture says. It's what we think it says, what we think it means, and how we think it applies. And so uh, we have to have spiritual discernment. We have to rightly divide the Word of God, and we have to be studious and, and look into these things and prayerfully consider them. But we can't prayerfully consider anything if we pull out a couple of verses that appear to contradict something and say, well, that what you're saying can't be true because of, of this verse. <laughs> we got we got to do better than that, my friend. we got to dig into the Word of God, and let's see what the truth is, and let's consider how all of these verses, unless they're completely contradicting one another, how these verses might be reconciled. And so that's the process of, of biblical study, studying the scriptures, which is what we're doing. So I, I try to untangle that for you and leave the, leave the outcome and the decision up to you. But 1 Corinthians 15 is so rich. Let's give the outline again. Uh, for 1 Corinthians 15. And we've already covered the first two parts, which is part one, Christ risen from the dead, and then number two, all things under his feet. So we covered that in the previous message. In this message, we're going to cover the heavenly man and victory over death and hell. So just to briefly recap, in case uh, you missed the previous session, I encourage you to go back and listen to it on the website. Uh, but to briefly recap part one, the first half of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, first of all, we said and we pointed out, and Paul makes the, the bold statement, that as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now the key words there is as in, even so. As in, even so. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Just as all means all, when we're talking about Adam and all died in Adam, even so in Christ, those all that died in Adam will be made alive again. So you see, that's a question of interpretation. Some people can read this and interpret it differently, but how do you know what's the right interpretation? Well, you interpret things within the context of all the other testimonies, all the other witnesses in Scripture. And if you see that consistently Scripture keeps saying the same thing in many different ways, then it would not be inconsistent to interpret one particular verse to harmonize with all the other verses that talk about the same thing. So as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. So that's the first big point that Paul makes. And then secondly, we learn that all in, that as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive, but they are not all made alive at once. And this is where, again, I think Christians have missed it. Uh, they are not all going to be made alive at the same time in Christ. So the idea that uh, everyone is going to pray the sinner's prayer just before you know, the end of the world, that's uh, not that that that. that, that 
doesn't seem to be any evidence in Scripture that that's going to be the case. Instead, we do see, and this is the key to understanding all of these things, it's the key to understanding the parables, it's the key to resolving all of these contradictions that you think you see, and I, and I understand those contradictions because I've studied them. You know, on the one hand, it it seems like only a few will be saved and many will be lost, but then you have so many more scriptures that talk about all will be made alive in Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, all flesh will look to me and be saved. He's the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. And uh, most people are not familiar with those those verses, or they uh, categorically weaken them or just pay no attention to them because the preeminent truth in their mind is destruction and judgment and hell and eternal punishment. And I'm telling you that just came directly from the religious tradition because that's exactly what the religious tradition embraces. Those are the preeminent truths of a religion based upon fear instead of a love relationship with God. So I'm just letting you know that when you embrace that majority view, you are embracing a religious tradition that has been developing over the last 2,000 years. Now, just because the church says it, and just because it's been a tradition to interpret it a certain way over the last 2,000 years, doesn't mean it's correct. So we need the mind of Christ, and we need the heart of God towards his word, and not just uh, blindly follow whatever tradition has taught us. So we see that in Christ all shall be made alive, but they will not all be made alive at the same time because God's purpose unfolds over successive ages. In Ephesians uh, chapter 2, it talks about, well, first of all, in chapter 1, it talks about that God has given him a name. He has highly exalted him above all every principality and power and name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And then in Ephesians chapter 2, it discusses the ages to come when God will continue to pour out and demonstrate his kindness towards us in Christ. So God's purpose is unfolding over a succession of ages, not all at once. And we are in one age, and then there's an age to come, and then there are the ages of the ages. And then the dispensation of the fullness of time, Paul says, the end, the end of the ages. And that's when God will gather together in one, all in Christ, in heaven and earth, in him. And we saw that as well. So these These ones who were made alive are not made alive all at the same time in Christ, but they are they are made alive in different ages. And it talks about three groups. Now, as uh, someone pointed out last week, and this was really good, I and I alluded to it, but I didn't get into the details of it. Um, And that is that in verse uh, 23, where it says each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Um, well, the word for order there has to do with a group or a troop. Uh, so it's it's a it's a plurality of people, and that has led some to conclude that the best way to translate this is not referring to Christ, but as referring to anointed first fruits, which has a connection to the overcomers in the Book of Revelation, as well as to the barley harvest, which is the first harvest. In Israel, and there's three harvests in all. There's the, there is the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and the grape harvest. Barley harvest, wheat harvest, and grape harvest. And those three occur in different ages. And uh, so Paul seems to be alluding to this when he discusses anointed first fruits, which is the overcomers, and then the wheat harvest, which comes, it says, afterwards. So first anointed first fruits. Afterward, it says those who are Christ's at his coming. So these will be those who belong to the Lord, but they are not overcomers. And if you if you need to get clarity on that, um, simply read the book of Revelation and 
consult with the teaching the Bible series that we did on the book of Revelation to see that uh, God makes a distinction between overcomers and those who belong to Christ but are not overcoming. So there's the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and then finally the grape harvest, and Paul places that at the end. Then comes the end, he says. So the end of this age is not the end of all ages. It's just the end of this age, and then there's an age after that, and then there's an age after that. But at some point, those ages end, and then comes the end, the true end, when death is destroyed, and it says that all are put under him. The Greek word there is pas, P-A-S. All are put under him, which fulfills this whole section and that promise that when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself also will be subject to God, and God will be all in all, pas in pas. And so that is the fulfillment of what Paul laid out in verse 22 of chapter 15. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now he's telling you in what order and how all will be made alive in Christ. So you see, we don't just lift up verse 22 and interpret it in any old way. We read it and we interpret it in the context of what Paul is talking about, each one in his own order. So the grape harvest has a correlation, again, to the end of the harvest. It has a correlation in the book of Revelation uh, to the wine press, um, where the the harvest is uh, is gathered in, and that that all has a, a prophetic and a symbolic significance uh, in Israel as well as in the prophetic scriptures. And so I, I encourage you to check out the book of Revelation for more information on that. But based on some of the responses and some of the questions that I had last time, I thought I would just share with you some additional thoughts for consideration. And, and this is based on, on some of the feedback that, I've, that I have received. And I, I realize that not everybody has had the benefit of reading all of my books, listening to all of the hundreds of hours of Bible teaching. And so if, if you are immersed into this, and this is your first time and you hear this, uh, I understand that you might uh, react to it negatively. Again, I would say the negativity that you are experiencing, the discomfort or the disturbance that you feel is more than likely the result of the fact that you have been uh, following a religious tradition for so long that paints God in a certain way and just naturally assumes certain things. Uh, but you never challenge that. You've never gone to Scripture. And so you hear something that seems to contradict that and uh, that that may be uncomfortable to you. But I would suggest that in any area where you want to grow spiritually, there's going to be some discomfort as you begin to examine things that uh, you took for granted that maybe are not true. When you dig into them a, a little bit more and you begin to examine them in the light of Scripture, uh, you find more and more of the religious tradition that, that we have all accepted and that, and that we've all been exposed to, uh, but we've got to challenge those things if we ever want to rise up above them. So some people are willing to challenge elements of the religious tradition, but they're not willing to, they, they don't fully appreciate, I don't think, how deep that religious religious tradition goes. And so much of what we've been trained to believe, what we have been trained to see, even how we approach God and how we see God is a result of thousands and thousands of sermons preached over thousands and thousands of weeks of attending church. And all of that is built on 2,000 years of church tradition. And just like the Pharisees, Jesus says, you nullify the word of God with your traditions and religious uh, systems of men are good at nullifying the Word of God with their tradition. The Christian tradition, many of their traditions nullify the Word of God. And one of those traditions is eternal punishment. I think that nullifies the Word of God. Now, of course, we can pull up scriptures that seem to teach eternal punishment. But again, if you study it out, 
you find that uh, you you have an, an an inaccurate translation, inaccurate interpretation, or an inaccurate application. And especially when you consider these things in the light of God's nature and character. Now, here's here's one way I want to illustrate that for you. Because I've had some people to say, well, of course God is merciful and he has grace and he has patience, but God also has anger and wrath and judgment. And he's all of these things at the same time. Well, is that true? I know that's what the religious tradition teaches. It also teaches that God behaves one way towards one group of people and he behaves in a different way towards a different group of people. And hopefully you're in the right group so that you get treated by God the right way. If not, then you are going to experience his anger, his wrath, and his judgment. Here's what I would like you to consider, that God has certain attributes, just like all of us have attributes. God has mercy. He has grace. He has patience and long-suffering. And it's true that God also has anger. God has wrath, and God has judgment. But there is one overriding element of who God is that is preeminent over all of these attributes. God has all of these attributes, but God is love. He is love. God is not judgment. God is not anger. God is not mercy and grace either, but God is love. First John 4, 8 He who loves knows God, for God is love. God is love. Right? So the point of that is to say that everything that God has flows out of who God is. Now, what if God was not love? What if God was something other than love? Then we would have to really evaluate Well, what is God, and how do these different attributes of God flow out of who he is? And it's just like you. You have different attributes. You have mercy and grace and patience in some situations. In other situations, you have anger. You have wrath. You certainly have judgment. You you pass judgment on, on others. You pass judgment on good and bad right and wrong, you pass judgment on on people who teach, if they're teaching the right thing, if they agree with you or don't agree with you, you pass judgment on, on, uh, we all do, on thousands of things. But we are not all of those things. We have all of those things, but we are not all those things. In other words, I get angry, but it's not my nature to be angry. God's nature is love, and so to properly understand these contradictions, these seemingly contradictory attributes of God, we have to evaluate them through God's character. God is love. God has all of these other attributes. So what does that mean? Well, all other attributes of God flow from his character and his love nature. His nature is love. Now, if his nature is love, then then that means his anger, his wrath, and his judgment is for a different purpose than sinful anger, wrath, or judgment. God's anger is not sinful. His wrath is not sinful. His wrath, his uh, judgment is not sinful. But everything flows out of his love. And the misunderstanding people have is that, well, God is sometimes merciful. Sometimes he's angry. Sometimes God has lots of grace, and sometimes God wants to pour out his wrath. Sometimes God is really patient and forgiving, but then there comes a time when God is judgment and he reveals his judgment and he's ready to punish. And it's as if God is one way sometimes and he's a different way other times. And especially if you're in the wrong group or if you're in the right group, then God treats you differently. What I want you to see is that there is one God. He doesn't change. And all these attributes of God all flow from his character and his love nature. So just as mercy, grace and patience are expressions of that love nature, 
So anger, wrath, and judgment are also expressions of the same love nature. The problem and the challenge I have and the disagreement I have with the religious tradition is they do not characterize God's anger, wrath, and judgments as expressions of his love, but they treat God's anger, wrath, and judgments as expressions of some other nature besides love, as some end of unto itself as as some uh, cosmic justice that God has to fulfill. But they don't characterize God's anger, wrath, and judgment as, as being an expression of his love nature. And his nature is to save, not to destroy. His nature is to heal and restore, not to punish forever. So what I'm telling you is that when Scripture talks about anger, God's anger, God's wrath, God's judgment, we tend to project onto God what we think anger is because we don't know how to be angry and be in love. We don't know how to exercise wrath from a love nature. We don't know how to exercise judgment without being judgmental. We don't know how to think of these attributes of God through the lens of love. But that's only because we don't know God well enough. We don't understand that God is love, and so therefore we don't understand that justice, mercy, grace, and patience express the love of God. So also anger, wrath, and judgment expresses the same love nature, but the difference is in the object and the reason and the purpose for that anger, wrath, and judgment, and it's to save, not to destroy. It's to heal and to restore, and it's not to punish forever. It's not to torture. Why? Because that's not consistent with God's love nature. Hell and death, according to 1 Corinthians 15, are enemies to be defeated. Hell and death are not prisons for lost souls to be tormented in flames for eternity. Pain, suffering, and endless torture are not consistent with love. And I doubt that people have really thought about this who just, as a knee-jerk reaction, they just accept whatever the church has taught them for the last 2,000 years. But if you, if you want to really talk about contradiction, how do you reconcile the contradiction of God who is love, but God who will torment people, billions of people, in agony for all eternity? <laughs> I mean, how does that even make sense? Pain, suffering, and endless torture are not consistent with love. I tell you what they are consistent with. Pain, suffering, and endless torture, that's consistent with the devil. As someone said, your God sounds like my devil. Because pain, suffering, and endless torture are more consistent with the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus says. The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He deceives the nations. He seduces God's people. And so pain, suffering, and endless torture are the result of sin and of death. And it's for this purpose, Scripture says, that the Son of God was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. To put an end to the devil, to destroy death, it says in Hebrews 2, through death, to destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Because that's what the devil does, destroys, steals, and kills, devours, torments. And it, it, you understand God so loves the world and he sent his son to be the savior of the world, to destroy the devil, to undo and and reverse what Adam did. He's going to make all things new, and in that new creation, that there is no sorrow or suffering or death. 
And furthermore, as we are learning in 1 Corinthians 15, hell and death are enemies to be defeated. So it's not as though God created these things in order to keep billions of lost souls in a torture chamber for all eternity. That's not consistent with his love. It's not to say that they don't exist, but they exist as enemies to God's purpose, and God's purpose is to save, heal, and deliver. So scripture declares the reality of wrath and judgment. Well, I don't deny that there's wrath and judgment, but I deny that the wrath and judgment is for a punitive purpose. Instead, it is for a redemptive purpose. So scripture does declare the reality of wrath and judgment, but also that God's anger is but for a moment, that his mercy endures forever, and that his mercy triumphs over judgment. Hallelujah! You should be rejoicing and praising God for that. And all this does, this truth, the scriptures that we bring out, all it does is it reveals where you are in the love of God. And we can hide behind our scripture verses just like the Pharisees did. They quoted scripture as a way to uh, to destroy the Lord Jesus. You can quote scripture in a way that destroys God's promise, destroys the love of God, and uh, mischaracterizes the love of God. And actually leads people astray. Or you can just embrace the truth that, yes, there is wrath and judgment. You do have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. But God is able, it says, to, to subdue all things under his feet. And we can all debate about how that will happen, when that will happen. But the point is, Scripture says it will happen. We do not yet see all things submitted to him. But when death is defeated, then all things will be gathered together in one in Christ, and God will be all in all. So there is wrath and judgment. There's death and hell. But all these things are temporary, and they're all working towards a purpose. So his anger is but for a moment. It's real, but it's only for a moment. It's not forever. It doesn't say his anger is forever. It says his mercy is forever. His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And also that mercy triumphs over judgment. Doesn't eliminate judgment, but mercy triumphs over judgment. So praise the Lord. I've got some additional thoughts for consideration. So long as we clearly understand that God will save them all in Christ, we have a scriptural basis for believing he is willing and able to save them all. Either God is willing but not able, or God isn't willing at all, even though he is able. And either way, it doesn't reflect the love nature of God. But we have to clearly understand that we're not saying any old path will do. We are saying that God will save them all in Christ, and in fact has already saved them all in Christ. He has already reconciled the world to himself. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And while we were enemies of God, he reconciled us to himself. Praise God. That's what it's all about. It's not about what you did, what you didn't do. It's about what Jesus did. So as long as we understand that, we're not saying there's a different way to God, only that God is able and willing to save them all in Christ, that they would all be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So repentance is necessary as well. We're not saying that it that repentance doesn't matter. We're not saying that your belief doesn't matter. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus. In him is life. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. But you're condemned already, it says. You're not condemned because you failed to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. He came to save you from your sins. But he who believes not is condemned already, it says. We're already perishing without him because in Adam all died. That's where the condemnation is. And you know, had people, again, repeating the religious tradition back to me. Well, people who don't receive Jesus as their personal Savior, God is going to condemn them to hell. Well, God is not the damner, number one. 
And secondly, we're perishing already without him. God sent not his son into the world to damn the world, which is what condemn means. God sent not his his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And if you don't believe in him, Scripture says, you're damned already. That's the whole point. He came to save the people from their sins, to loose them and let them go and, and to free them. Well, we could go on and on, but uh, it, it's it's not as complicated as as some people make it out to be. It's only complicated. It, all, it only creates a problem because of this religious tradition that we have accepted. So the, the final thing I would say is this, that my beliefs on this don't require your agreement. I, I don't require you to agree with me on this particular thing. You're free to disagree. You're free to believe whatever you want to believe. My beliefs on this don't require you to agree with me. But if you accept the religious tradition of eternal punishment based on biased translation, biased interpretation, and biased application of God's word, and you ignore everything else the Bible says concerning God's plan for all people, then let me tell you the consequences the fruit of that decision. Believe whatever you want to believe, but if you don't, if you continue to accept the religious tradition of eternal punishment, here's here's the fruit of that. First of all, you're living in a fear-based religion instead of a love-based relationship. And if that's how you relate to God, That's what you end up communicating to other people, whether you intend to or not. That's what they pick up on. Fear-based religion instead of love-based relationship. The the second consequence is an oh-well attitude towards billions of lost souls that Jesus died to save. You put all the responsibility on them for saving themselves by praying the sinner's prayer, and you don't believe that God can do anything to save them. Then this results in an oh well attitude. (laughs) Oh well, they had their chance. Or oh well, they had an opportunity. Oh well, they didn't pray the sinner's prayer. Oh well, they didn't accept Jesus as their personal savior. And that puts you in the same category as the Pharisee, standing in the temple, praying with himself, saying, God, I thank you that I am not like other people are, especially like that tax collector sinner over there. I, I prayed the sinner's prayer, and I received Jesus as my personal Savior. And uh, I realize that billions of people are going to go to hell, but oh well, they had their chance. That's the attitude that this leads to. And that's, that's why the church really doesn't care so much about saving lost souls. They don't care so much about praying and interceding for all to be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. As long as they are saved and their loved ones are saved, that's about all they, they really care about. And the rest of the world, oh well. The third consequence, I would say, is an angry, scary God instead of God who is love. And that that is a fear-based religion. When you see God as angry, God who has to be appeased, God who could be displeased with you at, at the drop of a hat, a schizophrenic God who is love and kindness and mercy and grace one minute, but angry, wrathful, vengeful, ready to take judgment, ready to pour down fire from heaven upon you the next, and you're, you are relating to an angry, scary God instead of a God who is love and merciful and forgives. And where sin abounds, his grace does much more abound. You don't even understand what grace is. Grace is a calculated miscarriage of justice. Grace is a calculated miscarriage of justice. Grace says that for these sins you deserve to be stoned, but I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's a calculated miscarriage of justice. 
So all so everybody that wants to defend God's justice and God's judgment, do you understand what grace is? Grace is a calculated miscarriage of justice. And where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. That's what mercy is all about, that he has not rewarded us as our sins deserve. See, we accept this on our own behalf, but we don't accept it on behalf of anyone else. We accept it in our case, in our situation, but we don't believe that God's grace and his mercy extends to all people everywhere. When, in fact, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if you want to be like your Father in heaven, it's not enough just to love one another, but you have to love your enemies. Then you'll be like your Father in heaven because he causes the sun to shine on the good and bad alike and his rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He's kind to the merciful and the unmerciful, and he does good to the evil and to the unthankful. I mean, seriously? That's the love of God. That's what we're talking about. We haven't even scratched the surface. We, we, we don't even know what that kind of love is, much less how to relate to, to God who loves every soul with that depth of love. We are more like the disciples who said, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven to destroy them? And Jesus says, you really don't know your own heart, do you? I've not come to destroy life, but to save it. And so this angry, scary God that we keep going around believing in our heart, relating to, that's the angry, scary God that we present to the world. And so the world rightly says, oh, who needs that? Or if they do get saved, it's for all the wrong reasons. And we bring them into a fear-based religion instead of a love-based relationship. Well, these are some of the consequences. The fourth is a small view of Christ instead of a large view of him. This is not about a doctrine. It's not about a teaching. It is not about my position on something. This is about whether you see a large Christ or a small Christ. A large view of Jesus and his finished work on the cross or a very small view of Jesus. That's how I see it. I see it as as either Jesus is truly the Savior of the world or, or he is only the Savior of some. And Scripture declares he is the Savior of all. In all of these things, Scripture declares all, every knee, every tongue, all flesh will be saved. So it really comes down to, do you really believe that? Do you believe that Jesus will have preeminence in all? That he will really gather together in one all? That as Jesus is lifted up, he will really draw all unto himself? Well, the answer depends upon whether you see Jesus as large or small. A large view of Jesus or a small view of Jesus? small view of Jesus can only imagine Jesus big enough to save only a few, only the few who are the best and the brightest and the smartest and who happen to be born in a Christian country, who had enough sense to believe in him and pray the sinner's prayer. And, of course, that's just a small percentage of the population compared to all the billions of people out there that are too dumb to to know the truth. Well, I just don't believe that God's plan of salvation is dependent upon luck or chance or fate or the fact that one person is born in a Christian nation and someone else is born in another nation. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by His Spirit. You were saved by grace anyway, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And yet we do boast. We boast about our faith, that our our great faith has saved us. The fact that we've accepted Jesus has saved us. The fact that we've made Jesus the Lord of our life has saved us, when in fact it was God who saved us in Christ. And not only us, taking away not just our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So either we see a a large view 
of what Jesus has done, or we see a small view of what Jesus has done. Death, darkness, and fear is not going to be greater than life, light, and love, but that's the fifth consequence if we accept this religious tradition. If we accept the idea that there's going to be some place in the eternal universe where billions of people are being tormented in flames, in agony, forever and ever and ever and ever without any possibility of redemption or that they would even go there to begin with, which I would challenge, but let's assume that they do and let's assume that they stay there forever and ever and ever, then what we are saying, if we accept that religious tradition, and then we are saying that death, darkness, and fear is greater than life, light, and love. It, that's what we're saying, at least for those billions of people. Death, darkness, and fear is greater than life, light, and love. Do we believe that? Or do we believe that life is greater than death, that light is greater than darkness, and that love, perfect love, casts out fear? It's the fear that has the torment, and God is love. Well, these are some of the consequences of the religious tradition. You may not have, it, you may not have thought about it. Well, look at this. The basis of our hope, one of the bases is Job 42, too, of all places, where Job says so many millennia ago, one of the oldest books of the Bible, he says, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I just love that verse. If you want to talk, if you want to pull out some verses, let's look at this verse because so many people will say, well, brother Chip, you know, I, I agree. It's God's will. It's God's will for them to be saved, but they're not all going to be saved no matter what God wants because they have to, you know, fill in the blank. Here's a list of things that they have to do. And it's usually all the things that we have already done. And so we content ourselves with the fact that we are saved. We checked off the to-do list and they have not. Well, God may want it. I'm, I agree with you. It's, it's God's will to save them all, but they're not all going to be saved, are they? Well, what does Scripture say? I love Job, Job 42, too, because it says, I know that you can do all things, and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So once you know what God's purpose is, which is to gather together in one, all in Christ, and this is the purpose that he purposed in himself from the foundation of the age, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he would gather together in one, all in Christ, in heaven and earth, in him. Every knee in heaven, earth, and under the earth bowing, and every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And he is working all things after the counsel of his will, according to his purpose. And when you know that he can do all things and that no purpose of his can be thwarted, then you have to... I think, reject the religious tradition that argues for a limited God, for a weak Jesus, and I would ask you to consider one final thing. If God loses forever one soul that Jesus died to save, then his purpose for that one person was thwarted, wasn't it? If God loses forever one soul that Jesus died to save, then his purpose for that one person was thwarted either thwarted by the devil or thwarted by their own sin and their own rebellion or thwarted by our failure to reach them with the gospel. Now you multiply that failure by billions of people and in my opinion, in my view, you have something, you have a situation, you have a scenario that contradicts scripture, it contradicts God's love, and it contradicts good old common sense. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com.